What does President Xi Jinping's China want? In one line, to make China great again. The deepest aspiration of over a billion Chinese citizens is to make their nation not only rich, but also powerful. Indeed, their goal is a China so rich and so powerful that other nations will have no choice but to recognize its interests and give it the respect that it deserves. The sheer scale and ambition of this China dream should disabuse us of any notion that the contest between China and the United States will naturally subside as China becomes a responsible stakeholder. Graham Allison in Destined for War can America and China escape Thucydides' trap? Hello everyone, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today I'm returning to our Cold Waters series. This is part 11 in our Let's Play of a Narwhal-class submarine trying to fight through World War III in our in the new Killerfish Games uh, game, uh, Cold Waters, which is the latest game out by the studio that also brought us Atlantic Fleet and Pacific Fleet. Now, in the last several videos, I haven't really been talking about the gameplay of the uh, series as I play through it. I've really been talking about history and kind of the Cold War history. But to understand the Cold War uh, is one thing, and to understand the s development of submarines, which is what I've really been focusing on in the series, is, is one thing. But I thought, you know, I've been reading this book by Graham Allison, Destined for War, and I thought, why not post kind of my own thoughts about this book? It's a new book. It just came out in 2017. As you could probably guess, that quote was, uh, you know, poking at Donald Trump's camp campaign slogan um, in looking at China. And, you know, this is an interesting book. We're talking about the Cold War submarines in this series. But what's the next conflict in the world? And I think a lot of people think the next natural superpower conflict anyway could be between China and the United States. Graham Allison certainly seems to think so. So I figure, why not talk about that and, and discuss his, his recent book? So to that end, I will discuss the book. Now, I'm going to link the book in the description. If this sounds like something you want to pick up and read, it'll be in there. The link will, of course, be an affiliate link. So if you do click on it and buy it, then um, I will definitely, you know, make a little bit of money, although I'm not going to uh, press anyone to go and buy it. it. It's basically just there. So, you know, if I was to link you to this book, someone else would, would get all the money. I figure if I'm talking about it and sending it over there, why not get, why not get my cut from the man? Um, but uh, enough of that, because that's not really the, the purpose. The, the link is mainly there in case you're interested yourself. So as you can guess, Destined for War is a book that's talking about the United States and China's relationship today and in the near future. The book is written by Graham Allison, who's a well-known uh, international relations scholar. He was very highly regarded during the Cold War. He's been a preeminent scholar looking at uh, nuclear policy as well as uh, various terrorist issues in the post-9-11 era. Um, and he did write what I think is a pretty well-regarded uh, biography on Lee Kuan Yew, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering the pronunciations there, uh, who was the Prime Minister of uh, Singapore and really is, is credited as kind of being the brainchild behind the, the rise of the, I believe it was the original Asian tiger economy in Singapore. Um, that book was called Lee Kuan Yew, The Grand Master's Insights on China and the United States and the World, uh, which was written in 2013 with a foreword by Henry Kissinger. Now, Destined for War just came out uh, in 2017, so there was a, a brief gap in there between, uh, between works. But it, between these two books, really Lee Kuan Yew, the, that book, and then the Destined for War book, are really the only two substantial works that, uh, that Allison has done on China. He really has focused the majority of his career on other issues, on nuclear policy, crisis decision-making, um, you know, sharing international responsibility was another work of his, uh, kind of talking about nuclear war, nuclear policy, uh, and American security. And, I mean, by no means am I someone to come out and criticize someone's expertise. It's I, I'm certainly not an expert, and I trust that Allison has done his work. Again, he's uh, very well regarded. I want to say he was, was he the dean of Harvard? Um, 
he was the dean of the John F. Kennedy School of Government, uh, which is at Harvard, so Harvard's Kennedy School. So he certainly has credentials to speak on history. But the reason I bring that up is this book, Destined for War, the principle the book is trying to talk about is it's trying to say, are the United States and China uh, on, on a course for conflict? And the central, um, the central example that the book goes to, uh, the central analogy that the book goes to is looking at Thucydides' Greece. So uh, if you've read your histories of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides, uh, you'll know that was a, he was an author, a historian, uh, back during the you know, ancient Greek time to talking about the, the Greek Peloponnesian Wars. And he sort of posits that the rising power of Athens um, and sort of the, the relative, it wasn't a decline, but the relative decline of Sparta meant that essentially the, the existing superpower Sparta and the rising Athens uh, meant that these, these powers would inevitably clash because, uh, you know, you have a, you have a stagnant great power and you have a rising new power at some point in time, these, their interests are going to come into conflict and then war will result. And, and Thucydides kind of identified that as the cause of the war between Sparta and Athens uh, in, during, again, ancient Greek times. Uh, and this was a destructive war that lasted decades. Uh, Thucydides didn't even live to see the end of it. It left uh, Sparta victorious, but it was a Pyrrhic victory, uh, very much so, uh, and uh, Athens uh, was, was defeated. It was in many ways similar to a world war of its times. And uh, Allison uses this as the basis for his thesis. Basically, uh, the trap, Thucydides' trap, is identified as, you know, if you have a, a, a reigning great power and a, another great power rises to challenge it, then inherently conflict ensues. And Allison does this by examining 16 different historical episodes where a reigning great power uh, has been challenged by a rising great power and does so effectively, right? I mean, he's Allison's very well regarded. He's uh, certainly a talented writer. Uh, he looks at numerous conflicts, conflicts between the French and the Germans, conflicts between the British and the Germans, uh, situ scenarios that didn't result in conflict, such as the rise of the United States uh, against uh, Great Britain and, and sort of the peaceful transition of uh, the British Empire's uh, preeminence to the American Empire, or not em em Empire, but the American, uh, you know, uh, century, if you will, the American uh, time of, of uh, supremacy. And, um, you know, he, he kind of tries to identify these key tenets. And I won't give everything away because I do think the book is worth worth reading and tries to explain, you know, here are, are examples where war ensued. And I want to say it was 11 or 12 out of the 16 examples he looks at uh, resulted in a war. And only four or so of them didn't result in war. The most prominent example of, of no war being the United States and Great Britain. Uh, in the post-World War II era, although he, he details further back than that, because America's rise really started before that. And I don't have an issue with the central premise of um, Allison's idea that a rising power uh, will naturally lead to some level of tensions and conflicts with the existing great power as, as those nations kind of become more in step. I just question whether the analogies are necessarily telling of a Asian, uh, you know, mindset. Because Allison, in another part of the book, Allison does a very good job of talking about the rise of China. This, this book would be telling in of itself, if you were just trying to understand the staggering and rapid growth of China over the last couple of, uh, couple of decades. Uh, it is mind-boggling, talking about how China in three years has laid more concrete than the United States laid in an entire century during its rise. Just this monumental building projects of, uh, you know, inter intercontinental road systems, multiple thousands of mile long road systems being built, just vast and, and still somewhat untapped uh, reserves of uh, you know, industrial might that China has become. Uh, he also looks at uh, some reports by the Rand Group, which I'm now actually reading, sort of influenced by his look, looking at the uh, U.S.-China scorecard, where uh, Rand basically went in in 2015, the end of 2015, and tried to identify trend lines with 
uh, military capabilities between China and the United States. And, and he talks about how, you know, that study proved that China's military power is rapidly rising. And then Allison took a, a brief stroll down looking at uh, Xi Jinping, the, the current ruler of China, and, and kind of his mindset of the world. He also talks a lot about China's, you know, China's own mindset, relying on figures such as Henry Kissinger and Lee Kuan Yew, the, again, the aforementioned ruler of uh, Singapore, um, to understand the mindset that China has. I think Allison does a very good job painting this picture of, I wouldn't say a revanche mindset in, in China, you know, similar to how after the 1870s war, uh, France had this uh, eternal desire to avenge itself for the humiliation suffered at the Germans. But he does paint a, a portrait of a China that is deeply scarred uh, by the 1900s, the early 1900s and, and late 1800s, where it was absolutely do not dominated and lorded over by European powers. So there's this mindset of, you know, China will never again allow itself to be humbled and humiliated in the, in, in the view of the world or in, in ourself. And so we must, you know, rise to greatness so that we can ensure this never happens again. This sort of, again, this never again mindset seems to be prevalent in his work. But I, I question the uh, breadth of his his sources just because again almost all and i'm not going to go into all the details of all of the different examples but whether he's looking at france and britain in the you know 17 and 1800s whether he's looking at uh, the british and the dutch in the 1600s uh, whether he's looking at sparta and athens in the you know the 400s bc uh, whether he's looking at germany and britain in the early 1900s um all of these different examples have a very Eurocentric focus. And I'm trying to remember if a single one of them involves looking at Asia. And the reason I bring that up is because Allison himself talks about how different the Chinese mindset is, how China's rise is not necessarily the same because Chinese don't view the use of force in the same way that Western powers historically have. He talks about how China takes a very long view of things, whereas Western democracies don't, and I think it's pretty clear he's right about that. But he also talks about how China will build things up economically or strategically, and they seem to have this mindset of, listen, we're going we're gonna to so stack the, against, the, so stack the deck against any potential opponent that war would basically be suicide. So we'll maneuver them diplomatically and economically to the point where if they do choose to resist, then they'll, you know, they'll suffer absolute destruction. And I think there's some truth to that. If you look at the way China's building up its area of denial, if you look at the way that China's building up its economic ties, if you look at the way that China's building its own development bank to tie Asia in close, you know, and, and make Asia ever more dependent on China, you can see China building this web of incentives against any sort of action to resist uh, Chinese expansion. And then he does go in and talk about China's actions in the South China Sea, which are very aggressive and very belligerent against its neighbors. He talks about China's perception of itself as the center of the world and this very much Chinese exceptionalism mindset, which I think is worth pointing out because at least in the Chinese government and in the Chinese culture that he does examine, there does seem to be the sense of China being the preeminent or sh you know should be the preeminent power. There's this historical tie in China dating back centuries of China viewing itself as the center of, of civilization. And I think it's interesting when you compare that against the United States, as he does, and that America has a very similar mindset. Now, America may be more reticent to use force than China is. Uh, you know, Ch America certainly has a history of using force uh, much more often than China does. But it's just, it's interesting to see the two put side by side, American exceptionalism and Chinese exceptionalism. I think a lot of times in the media today, you hear about American exceptionalism in a negative way and about how, you know, the, the U.S. is the only country that, that acts this way and that, uh, you know, it's, it's very much uh, not justified. And yet I think, you know, part of that is because China is rising, but they have been so far behind that they just haven't had the power to act in that way. And it'll be interesting to see where things go. Now, to Allison's credit, he's not using these analogies in any way to point out that war is inevitable or, or is something that will will result. What he's trying to argue is he's trying to say, listen, there are very good historical parallels to look at China and say, this is naturally going to be a point of contention. These are two countries that view themselves very highly, and I'll go ahead and quote another part of his book. And Allison says, and I quote, 
Despite their many differences, the United States and China are alike at least in one respect. Both have extreme superiority complexes. Each sees itself as exceptional, literally without peers. And I think that's interesting to hear because you often hear of, you know, the sort of arrogance of, of America, arrogance of, of Western uh, superiority in, in global affairs. And yet, I think that's just been more side effect of, you know, the, the country with the guns, the country with the power is the country that tends to be arrogant. Um, so in, in essence, I think, I think what Allison does a good job of is he does a good job in illustrating the rise of China and trying to paint this just absolutely mammoth picture of this, this incredible rise in, in history. And he talks about how unparalleled it is, you know, how exceptional it is, how no one's ever seen this kind of growth before. And, and while that's true in raw numbers, I don't think China's rise today is any less disruptive than Germany's rise or, or the U.S.'s rise in the past. He also tries to make the point that China and U.S. cultures are so different. Part of the reasons when you look at countries that did not go to war so again, he looks at these 16 case examples and goes into great depth, which I'm not going to detail here. Uh, if you if that's something you're interested, check the book out. Um, and he goes into great depth, taking a look at here are some different examples of, of where conflict occurred. Here are examples where it didn't. But he makes the case that, like in the case of the U.S., uh, the, one of the reasons the U.S. and Britain didn't go to war is at least in part because their you know their uh, cultures were the same or, or similar. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote again from the book. Allison says, Being overtaken, and he's talking about Britain and the United States, being overtaken by a rival who shares common values such as Britain, grudgingly watching an upstart America surpass its power, but largely preserve its cultural, religious, and political beliefs is one thing. It would be quite another to be surpassed by an adversary whose values are so strikingly different. Hillary Clinton spoke for most Americans when she said, I don't want my grandchildren to live in a world dominated by the Chinese. So again, here Allison is kind of trying to point out that in his examples where peace did occur, often cultures were the same, histories were the same, religions were the same. There were unifying factors that prevented conflict. And he tries to point out that in the case of the U.S. and China, that's not necessarily the case. Again, he's not calling for war. He's not saying that war is inevitable. But what he's trying to say is here are the things we have to, you know, pitfalls we have to avoid. I think he does a good job in countering the argument that, well, the world is more interconnected than it ever has been. You know, a, a war would ruin the economies of everybody. Therefore, a war is impossible and that everybody knows this. Um, I think that's a naive way to look at things economists and historians were saying the same thing right before World War I, and Europe went to war anyway. So I'm, I'm appreciative of him calling that out as something we need to be mindful of and avoid that trap. I just am not convinced that Allison um, really goes into enough, enough detail looking at Asian examples. I think you're learning the wrong lessons if you're saying, here are some great examples of similar conflicts, but none of them pertain to the culture or the society that we're examining. And maybe there just aren't good examples of, of the fall of China. The, I think the one Asian example he has is the conflict between Japan and the United States before World War II and sort of how a economic conflict over resources and Japanese expansion in Asia led to a conflict between the United States and Japan. But I'm not sure that's... I don't know if that's a good example or not. I, it didn't seem strikingly uh, apparent or, or necessarily relevant to the way that China's rises. He also provided some hypothetical ways that war could erupt. I found the scenarios that he did use for a hypothetical outbreak of conflict uh, pretty unrealistic and far-fetched. Um, but with all of that being said, and I know I'm being somewhat negative of the book, I think it's an interesting read if you're trying to understand how rapid China's rising. I think it's an interesting read if you want to hear about you know other scenarios where great powers did rise and where conflict either did or didn't occur. Um, I wrote uh, my own uh, thesis on my I was a double major in history and international relations on the rise of not specifically on the rise of China but kind of paralleling the relationship between the British and the Germans in the lead up to World War One and then the United States and China today. And I think in my view that's almost the most apt analogy that you could use and that Britain and, and Germany were very close trading partners in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s. Um, they had rather amenable relations uh, prior to the Kaiser, Kaiser II taking power. Um, they had no real history of direct conflict. Um, 
you know, obviously Germany was a new country, so be that what it may. Um, and things rapidly deteriorated as Germany rose. Germany was a country with a very conservative political ruling party. It was a country with a rapidly rising navy, rapidly modernizing army, um, you know, a, a land power in its own right, uh, attempting to become a sea power uh, to challenge the existing order. And Germany sort of had this inferiority complex where they were always looking to, um, you know, get their place in the sun, as it would be. And again, you see reminiscences of that in China with their desire to never, you know, be subject to Western domination again. You see that with their desire to be regarded by the United States as equals on the international stage. Uh, and again, all of these very reminiscent of, of China. You see a, a conservative German ruling party uh, trying to suppress any sort of democratic movements or ideals and a very martial sense of hyper patriotism. All again, what you see in China, the Communist Party is not ruling a, China, a communist China, but it's a very conservative party trying to maintain order and, and rule over a, um, you know, of a, of a population that has free economic ruling as Germany did, uh, but not free political ruling. So there are a lot of parallels there, but fundamentally the cultures are different. And I guess that's my main criticism of this work is it doesn't seem to uh, understand or examine how the culture of China might be different than the examples provided. It does talk about how the culture is different from the United States, without a doubt. But I just am not sold on the, uh, the examples it uses as being super relevant to how a conflict would unfold with China. And I think the examples where war does break out and, and the way that things escalate uh, show... <sighs> just show a, a rather fanciful way in the way things escalate. Those, those stories were kind of a little bit of a down, uh, a down portion of the book. All things being said, though, it's still uh, an interesting and worthwhile book. I don't think he delves into enough detail behind some of the structural weaknesses of China, uh, between the aging population, between the you know fact that a huge percentage of the population of China is still not rich, uh, as the as the country is becoming you know growing a um, growing middle class and is rising rapidly, there are plenty of structural issues within China, and I just. I don't know. I mean, I'm not. To me, it seems like Allison is throwing this and you know has this really good analogy concept, but I don't know if it's applicable because it doesn't seem to me like he's uh, he he fully backs up his understanding of Asia. I think he's too reliant on a few sources, and it would have been nice to see him delve into more his you know more uh, varied sources rather than just Lee Kun Yew and and uh, Henry Kissinger. Uh, if he was really trying to claim a deep understanding of China. With that being said, I still think it's a worthwhile book to look into. Uh, just not, you know, in my top 10 of books, if you will. Uh, anyway, guys, let me know what your thoughts. Uh, that's kind of enough of me rambling at this point. Um, it was an interesting read, and I'm always uh, curious to check kind of more of these these sorts of books out. Again, my thesis was on Germany and uh, and England and the United States and China, and I do think there's a lot of parallels there. I certainly hope we avoid conflict. I would never uh, wish for any sort of conflict, but I think it's important to stay up to date with these kind of books, these kind of works, to try and understand what is going on in the world, because we often hear about the U.S. Navy launching freedom of navigation operations in and around the South China Sea. We hear about Chinese aircraft flying in close to uh, to U.S. aircraft and, and showing their weapons. And, um, you know, I think if I was to say one thing that I think seems more likely is I'm not sure uh, Xi, 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 Jin, oh my God, uh, Xi Jinping is necessarily the biggest threat, uh, given he lived through the Cultural Revolution. If I was going to point to, um, you know, an area where I think the U.S. and China could, could have a conflict, it will be in that next generation of leaders who grew up before China was super rich, uh, but they have the sort of this in, inherent confidence of China because the only thing they've ever known was a rapidly rising China, uh, where they didn't experience the, uh, you know, the terrors of uh, of the Cultural Revolution, and where they didn't experience the uh, negatives uh, to to communist rule before uh, Deng Xiaoping. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see, but I, I kind of think that would be my perception of, of there's sort of this window of where China isn't yet, uh, you know, to the point where they, they fully comprehend their power. And maybe there's this uh, period of, of arrogance before capability uh, where they've risen, but not all the way and they act pr premature. Um, but I guess we'll see. I mean, it was 
it was an interesting book nonetheless. Anyway, guys, that's kind of enough of me rambling. I don't want to draw this out any more than uh, any more than necessary. You can see here that uh, enemy, I think it was a kilo, just killed itself by diving below its crush depth. Uh, we had a torpedo that was kind of chasing it down, and uh, it, uh, it, it crushed itself there. Um, so good for us, I suppose. Anyway, guys, I want to know your thoughts below, uh, so please comment. Let me know your thoughts if you've read the book, if you, what your thoughts are on kind of my uh, view of the book, and feel free to share below. Uh, this particular battle that I'm in the middle of still has about 10 minutes left. I don't want to chop the video off and not show the end of the fight, so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to go ahead and revert to the live stream audio uh, that uh, I captured while recording this, and then I'll go ahead and uh, meet you guys back at the end. So enjoy this little bit of bonus footage uh, for the next 10 minutes or so to watch the the fight conclude and i will see you guys in a minute that's the general direction that they might be in oh, shit enemy torpedo i think this one's coming from this direction switch to passive god these damn things are invisible Oh shit, I didn't mean to go to flank. Alright. I'd love to know where the bearing of it. I'm pretty sure it's off this direction somewhere. He's closing on me. Fuck the diesels. Oh shit. Firing back down their bearing. Yeah, that torpedo's gonna gonna acquire on us, I'm pretty certain. Shit. That target's really that close, that's gonna be an issue. We're not gonna acquire till behind it. Trying to jump above the lair. I don't think it has me yet, it's too far down. Oh, now it's gonna have me. Probably. Oh shit, I'm gonna breach. And we're dead. Alright, let's get back down into the water. We need to get some steer steerage. I know we're gonna cavitate here, but I'd rather get I need to get some depth. I think our, our sonar may have acquired. Okay, so he's circling, he's not yet ready to close. Oh, he's closing now. We hit something that way. Alright, so we hit the foxtrot. So our snapshot with active sonar down the bearings appears to... Oh, God. We are diving way faster than I... Let's not crush the ship. Let's see where this torpedo goes. Pretty sure that Foxtrot's a goner. Yeah, he is. All right. All 
right, let's level out. Anything else in the water? Just the one torpedo. I think it's circling above us. I don't think it has us. Yep, all right, so we evaded that torpedo. Okay. RIP the audio for a second there. Did my audio drop out, guys? Sorry about that if my audio dropped. So do we just keep pinging away with active sonar until the enemy stops shooting at us? Because it seems to be the only way we can detect these diesels is, is flushing them out with active sonar. Alright, is the mic good now, guys? Sorry if it dropped for a second there. If it really is a wolf pack, I'm assuming there's something. Now, they may be further out. We may not be able to know for sure. Well, Ethan, keep in mind that in Silent Hunter, you were generally firing your torpedo into the side of an enemy ship. In this game, the way the Mark 48 is designed is it goes right under the keel of the enemy ship and blows up there. Additionally, in this game, you're fighting a lot more enemy submarines than you are surface vessels. So surface vessels often will take more than one shot, although not so much in this game. Um, mainly because the torpedo is going right under the hull and blowing it there and breaking the back. But, you know, if you hit a, a World War II sub with a torpedo, one torpedo and it's gone too, so... Let's make a whole bunch of noise, guys. We'll fire off another moss. Well, I may outrun my moss if I'm at flank speed. No bears. Just checked. There's no air or equipment. I may be too deep to cavitate, but I'm, sh I'm sure they'll hear my uh, active sonar. That creaking noise is always unnerving. I'm happy we got the kilo. Foxtrot apparently, when you hit them and sink them, they don't crush when they go to the, the bottom. That's my moss. No way to shoot down planes in this game. You don't have any anti anti air weapons. All right, I don't, I don't want to leave the battle because I feel like there's several other enemy subs around, but they may have learned their lesson to stop shooting at me. Oh shit! Let's not go below crush depth. <laughs> I almost just blew my sub up because of time compression. I almost dove too deep. Oh boy, we're on the surface. Surface the boat. <laughs> Didn't mean to do that. I think we're still active. Switch to passive and see if we pick anything up. Probably not. Nothing in the water either. <sighs> I don't want to end the battle and just let them get away, but I kind of feel like they have. I guess. I thought it was a, a, a four to six sub wolf pack, but... 
I guess I'll give up. We'll see. Yep, I guess you guys are right. The only two enemy submarines were engaged and sunk. Fine work dealing with those boats, Commander. Your contribution to the war effort will make transit for our convoys a lot safer, and supporting the troops on land is what the Navy is about. Keep it up, Commander. Await new orders. All right, guys. So... Awesome. Uh, Dan, I wouldn't say it's a skirmish-only game. It's more like Silent Hunter in that it's a dynamic campaign, except you directly influence the results. It's it's not as deep or as compelling as Silent Hunter at this time, but uh, I wouldn't call it a skirmish-only game. I mean, in that in that logic, so was Silent Hunter. I never found the scripted scenarios all that enjoyable in Silent Hunter, to be honest. Okay. Wolves driven off. Incidents involving attacks on transatlantic convoys by hostile submarines in and around the North Atlantic have rapidly diminished. An anonymous spokesperson suggested increased NATO submarine operations in the area, a contributing factor. However, the Pentagon has refrained from comment on submarine operations. Without the threat of attack from submarines, transatlantic crossings are becoming more efficient and suffering less losses. If this improved influx of supplies and more material can be sustained, NATO forces will be in a position to take the fight all the way back to the Iron Curtain, which we kind of already have. NAVOPS plans to forestall new enemy operations by hitting warships in port and the port facilities themselves. You are hereby ordered to sail to within 100 miles of Archangel in order to launch at least 10 TLAM missiles at this target. Important, if you do not have 10 TLAM missiles aboard now, you must return to Holy Lock and rearm with 10 TLAM missiles for this mission. Okay, so it appears that we are going to have a land strike mission. Oops. So we've got to sail back to Holy Loch. All right, guys, and that's going to do it for this episode of uh, of my Cold Waters Let's Play. I hope you enjoyed both the gameplay and uh, at the end there, and also the book review. Let me know your thoughts uh, below. Uh, I don't really provide buying guides, if you will. I'm not going to say, yes, buy this or don't buy this. Um, I'm just kind of providing my own thoughts of the book, and, and uh, I like to try and do these every once in a while, so let me know if you enjoyed it. You know, if not, then, uh, you know, um, well, sorry, because I enjoy doing these every once in a while. I'm thinking about doing one on a War Machine, the Netflix uh, exclusive with uh, uh, Brad Pitt that's kind of a hypothetical story of Stanley McChrystal. Uh, hypothetical and not hypothetical. It's based on Stanley McChrystal, but they change a few things so that it's not really about Stanley McChrystal, but it's really about Stanley McChrystal. Um, so I may do a just kind of a discussion on that one. That would probably be short, maybe five, ten minutes, so we'll see. Um, I am going to continue, obviously, the historical series behind uh, these these. Um, episodes so i intend to return you know looking at uh, the development of the uss nautilus also taking a look at soviet boat developments because so far i've only looked at uh, post-world war ii u.s submarines in the early cold war uh, i fully intend to return to looking at um, you know u.s boats but also soviet boats i'm trying to figure things out to understand like when the actual soviet campaign is going to be available um because i'd like i know there's a mod out there that lets you drive soviet boats but i'd like to do a let's play of a soviet campaign and if i could time that to you know do talk about the history of soviet submarine development while playing a, a you know a a campaign with Soviet submarines, I think that would be great. I'm just not sure when that's coming. I have no idea if that's, you know, weeks away, months away, who knows, I don't know. Um, but if I'm able to find out if it's coming soon, then I may hold off on the Soviet boats until that's available. Otherwise, I may just have to have either use the mod and play with it that way or um, start it with, with the footage that I have. Um, with that being said, guys, that's enough of my rambling. Hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know your thoughts below. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.